Uh, this is basically an opportunity for people to ask questions of the studio faculty and graphic design faculty who are in the show. So I have all your questions here. And I'm just going to start asking them. And I'm going to hand the microphone to the artist in question. So if you hear your name, faculty, if you could come forward and help me out there, that would be great. Justin Renier, you're really near me. <laughs> Justin, um, someone wants to know, what was the inspiration behind Spring is Chain Snatching Season? And could you explain the background story? And yep. if you want to point us to the work in question, that would also help probably. Okay. Hi. Um, it's, this, uh, it's this piece right here with these uh, little wooden painted panels. And um, really, it's, uh, it's a couple of different things going on at once. One thing is uh, most of the work, if you've seen any of the previous faculty shows that I do, is really technical um, motion graphics kind of stuff, abstraction, and also a lot of client design work. And I'm a designer primarily, but, um, but I come from an art background. So part of it was just a process so that I could get off of the computer and do some things. Um, I've got a three-year-old, and this was like the kind of work that I could do kind of piecemeal. And I have hundreds of these little panels. Um, but as far as uh, I did about, I don't know, about 300 of these panels, and half of them are typographic. Um, I'm really interested in... Um, in graphic design kind of typography, but also uh, traditional sign painters and that kind of lettering. Um, and the other half are, are these kind of weird little pictograms. But this was assembled into this message of spring is chain snatching season because it was this, uh, this phrase that, I, that I, it's always stuck with me. I, gr I grew up in New York and it used to be a PSA that was in the subways that said, literally, when it was springtime, it said spring is chain snatching season because uh, now you've got all your outerwear off and uh, there was a lot of uh, theft and stuff like that at that time. And um, that was sort of the world that I grew up in. So it was, it's just an odd juxtaposition of the idea of spring and, you know, and, and literally on that ad it had flowers and these kind of things and then somebody grabbing somebody's necklace so <laughs> it was a it's kind of a humorous sort of thing um but yeah that's that's probably more than anyone needed <laughs> teresa holder are you somewhere in the room teresa holder yeah there she is okay um someone has asked in your painting quiet the voices you use the phrase quote your mumbling I was curious if the possessive version of this phrase relates to the meaning of the piece, and how. Um, actually, that just kind of happened. While I was creating the piece, I was imagining what people were saying while they were walking up to it and looking at it. Like, that looks like marble. And that's actually where it came from. It was me reacting to my thoughts of somebody reacting to my piece. <laughs> so I'm like, you're mumbling. <laughs> Someone wants to know, what was the visual inspiration behind the, I'm going to go with fractured shapes and elements within your excavation series? Repeat the question. <laughs> what was the, the visual inspiration the visual behind inspiration? The fractured shapes and elements? These pieces are totally improvisational, so I can't say that I was looking at anything, and I'm not sure what the inspiration was behind those. One of the one of the things I enjoy about this new body of work is that they are so uh, uh, unselfconscious and really uh, I'm proud of them because I feel there's no attempt to make art involved in those pieces. So, well I think sometimes as artists we're conscious of trying to make you know that we're working on a work of art and in this case the pieces were so improvisational, and so spontaneous that none of that was there, none of the premeditation. And uh, the, it's hard to say when you're just kind of letting your psyche go what is actually inspiring the images other than to say they seem organic and perhaps even have something to do with an internal or, uh, organic material. I couldn't say beyond that what inspired them. Could you tell us about your decision to include an internal poem inside your piece titled Offering? As opposed to having it outside, you mean? 
or just in general? Well, to give some background, I had a student come up to me while I was walking past, and he said, in the medium description, this work says internal poem. What does that mean? And I said, it means the poem is inside the piece. And he said, where? <laughs> and I enjoyed that he thought I knew. Um, so I said it was in the middle. So you can tell me if I was right and explain why it's there. OK. Um, well, um, there have been times in my life where I've made pieces, and um, there was a content to them. And I didn't want to just write it all over the surface of the piece. And uh, I think the visual image can be quite powerful on its own. Um, however, there is a poem literally inside the piece. Um, many pieces I've made that you were inten intended to open to look inside and look in and maybe touch something, take it out. In this case, um, the piece is the, the uh, poem is inside as extra power, if you will, uh, inside the piece. Um, it's screwed behind that um, window, if you will, and not intended to be taken out. But there literally is um, are uh, six concentric rings in which of copper, which the poem is written both on the outside of it and the inside of it etched into the rings and there's wooden spacers between it. And so uh, that particular piece, too, uh, my son and daughter uh, uh, were recently brought into the world um, via my wife. And <laughs> that's how it happened. Hey. <laughs> anyway, um, and uh, George Bush was actually, the second one was in office, and we were fighting in the Iraq War, and I was just really upset about that. And I felt like he was setting up um, my children in the future uh, with debt and um, political um, problems in their lives. And so it was kind of an offering or peace offering and I wanted to make that peace in some way as hoping for peace in the world. So that's kind of where that comes from. What is the significance of the key shape in your sculpture? Very simple question. Can you explain it? Uh, the key shape in the sculpture is referred to a key for a car, and really it's a hybrid between the key and a person to suggest that we're one and the same, is that we govern kind of our lives. And so this piece was to think about this kind of social economic circumstance of, you know, being in the place where we have the choice to drive what we want to or um, open certain doors that we want to as well. Um, someone wants to know, what was the inspiration for the multi-dimensional aspect of your work? Well, um, the inspiration behind the multi to have it in different layers is so that uh, the viewers could actually engage with the piece by between walking closer up to the prints or behind the target or even behind the whole thing and getting the whole view. Um, and that way that uh, the viewers are become more active participant in the work instead of just viewing it, you become part of the problem or part of the, the work itself. And I love this question for a graphic designer, because graphic designers do get called on to create specific types of work. So how do you negotiate your creativity and the demands of the client? <laughs> this is also funny, because I am currently one of Phil's clients. <laughs> yeah, I have to spend like years of... Uh, experience as graphic designer, I learned that how to convince my client. And if they ask a certain questions, if they request something, I always make sure that I have all the answer and lead them to the direction I want to. So I, I think I'm pretty good at it. Uh, I am pretty good at it. And as I get more experience, uh, that's how I deal with this kind of problem. And question or requesting, I make sure them the, to, to lead them to the direction I like. So, but you have to do a lot of practice to convince them. So, that's what I do. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I mean, I respect them in a way, but, <laughs> but uh, I know how to work with them. So, that's what I do. <laughs>
Thank you. <laughs> I have to say, I was pretty convinced that when we're working on a website project, and uh, and I was pretty convinced that he gave me like a really terrible one, a sort of okay one, and then a really really beautiful one on purpose. <laughs> How about a, a studio person for the same question? The question was, do you ever receive pressure to create certain types of art or specific types of art? Angie Peel, I can see you too. You know, it's funny, I was just actually talking about this with our new dean, but um, I was saying, when I make work, the concept drives the choices in the art making. So for me, I guess the answer to that is no. <laughs> um, because I sort of let um, the meaning guide my choices and what the piece looks like. So you know, as a result, I'm not afraid to kind of push into new territory with what the image looks like. You know, I don't think you guys should be afraid of doing that either. You're here to experiment. But um, I guess in terms of pressure to create consistency, yes, you can. Uh, create a body of work that sort of um, speaks to um, each each piece. Each, look, each piece communicates with one another better if they have a consistent look. So I think there is a pressure to create consistency in a in a body of work. But um, I'm also not afraid to sort of reinvent and make a new body of work. Can I ask a follow up? just because I, I just helped you lift giant pieces of work into crates. <laughs> um, what about things like scale or medium? Like, do you feel pressure to work in a particularly saleable or exhibitable kind of work? Those two things are diametrically opposed. Um, big work is uh, exhibitable and always um, sort of appealing in the gallery, but small work is um, easier to ship and cheaper to make. and more saleable, generally. So I do think that there's pressure in, in terms of kind of compiling a list of shows to produce smaller work so that you can kind of get it out faster. But uh, I mean, my heart is in making bigger pieces, uh, which are um, very expensive to ship. I'm dealing with this right now because I'm sending work in big crates across the country. Um, so yeah, there is a kind of management struggle that happens once you have pieces that are different scales. but. Um, I also am kind of of the mindset that that shouldn't be something that defines the way that you make work. If you really want to make something, you find a way to exhibit it, and you find a way to make it saleable, and you find a way to make it happen. As one who teaches jewelry making, but doesn't make jewelry necessarily, um, commissions come by uh, to do things that are really incredible, and if there's time based on life all the things that go on with it, I think it's very appropriate to make things that aren't necessarily what you do as your body of work. Um, and uh, I've been very fortunate to do some things that are really pretty incredible um, opportunities uh, as commissions. And so they don't look like my work necessarily, but they are great opportunities and they usually pay really well. And I don't mind that at all. <laughs> Steve Loftus, are you here? Aha! Um, this is about the erased, and the question is, what was your process on making your poster design? What tools and textures did you use on your image? And type making, was most of the image, images, with, ugh, excuse me, were most of the images in type done by hand? And also, what paper is it printed on? Very technical questions for you. <laughs> okay, what was the first question? Okay, as far as tools and textures go, um, well really what kind of drove the design of that is it's, it's this piece set in the 60s, it's kind of loosely based on these really gory like Italian horror films. And um, so thinking about those and seeing the kind of scary writing and then thinking about like Rubber Soul by the Beatles, for example, that just shift uh, of perspective that you see. Um, what I did is, is a lot of that stuff is hand done, like the type, um, the drippy stuff that you see is done um, with a brush and then just kind of like take it up vertically and hit it on the table and let those drips appear. 
Um, and then the imagery that comes from it uh, are taken directly from the film itself. So actually the way I got those images is since they didn't like have any of these weird, um, you know, they didn't like go into the DVD or anything and take a screenshot. They like photographed the TV and sent me the images, which in the end it ended up doing these really interesting stripes and such in the background. So that was really nice, and then it's just kind of like a combination of layering images on top of each other and some kind of color modification and things like that. And it's printed on Reeves BFK, which you should be familiar with. How do you find ideas and inspiration and the courage to experiment with new mediums and techniques? What was the first part? How do you find ideas and inspiration and the courage to experiment? Um, so for mine, I'm always thinking about what is your idea of home? So for my personal piece, I try to just think of things that whenever I see to it, I just instantly think of what overall my idea of home is and then what does that mean to you? So for mine, I was born here in Stillwater and then lived in a log cabin with 18 acres. And so a lot of my childhood was just spent roaming the woods, um, which seems really strange to me because I was so tiny and, um, you know, I'm not quite sure what my parents were thinking, letting us just go outside for so long all day long, but so whenever I see the woods, it just kind of really brings me back to my childhood, and so I tend to kind of keep these images going over and over, and, um, and then also for mine, I did a giant horse with a skeleton back on top of it, and so for this, my inspiration, over 10 years ago, I took an anatomy for artist class, and so my professor, we drew nude models during class, and then went home and then did a vellum overlay back on top of it and had to draw all of the bones. And so from this, I really started uh, just getting really interested in anatomy, and I went and bought a full-size plastic skeleton just for that class to help me. And so I still have Bucky in my studio, and I see that every time when I walk in, and every once in a while I forget that it's there and scares the crap out of me. Um, but it's always wonderful inspiration for me, and so that's, that's it. Um, so like, you know, without compromising the structure of something to make it like an art piece, or, you know, or do you want it to be more like an art piece or like serve as a piece of furniture? You know what I mean? Because like, seeing a sculpture right next to like a piece of furniture, it's kind of like, I'm seeing like this staircase, but this is obviously sculpture. This next one down is kind of somewhere in the middle, and I can see this one down here actually being used as like a coffee table or something. I don't know, is that how you circle through that, or are there some pieces that you don't think are gonna be functional at all, or? I'm Morgan Robinson. I made the sculptures here in the middle with the, the red, in the center of the freestanding sculpture and in the black piece and the, the smaller round piece. And he's, uh, he's referring to the functional element of, of the two uh, pieces on the pedestal. Um, I really had shapes initially growing up and, and really didn't know a place for them uh, with a career. Um, I didn't have my first art class until my second year of college and so it was been a big mystery on how to use these shapes with with uh, reality. And jewelry was my first step and I've increased the scale of my shapes uh, from brooches to to furniture to sculpture uh, with using sometimes the similar shapes that I used in jewelry just uh, increasing the scale de depending on what what was at hand. So uh, I, I, I like the element of function with my art because uh, there was always that question, what, what is it, what do you do with it? And uh, if I could have a function help that answer, but uh, to me they were always just beautiful shapes that I'm surrounded with, that we're surrounded with in, in nature through our daily lives, but I like to pull the shapes out and really give attention to some of those shapes. And if you could tweak them with a little uh, function, then it helped uh, somehow the, a person with without an art background or without much art experience to ha at least try to have a, a way to approach art in general. But uh, the, the fine line to me with, with a functional piece of sculpture or a, a non-functional piece is it, it doesn't exist. It, uh, 
the, the beauty of the form is still there whether you use it or not. And uh, you can, it, it, it plays with your imagination and it transcends you from where you are, hopefully either back into you, yourself uh, through your own past or into the future with a place you haven't yet been or seen before. It says that the, your pieces are inspired by growing up listening to hip hop. I was just kind of wondering what you listen to. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, in a lot of the writing that I do, I tend to be pretty wordy. And this was something that I thought could function um, almost as a, a haiku, where it would be very distilled. And so it, it sounds very sort of uh, perfunctory, but it, it's so pieces, I mean, because I have a lot of these different pieces, and they are about growing up because this is the kind of um, um, ephemera that really got, got me excited about um, graphic design and, um, and art. And, um, and hip hop was sort of just the, the filter that, um, that I sort of lived through because it was really the first generation of, I mean, I remember when there were only a few hip hop records like out, you know what I mean? And um, also hip hop is something that um, is really collage based and a, and, a, and a mesh of a lot of different things and real DIY. And that's my entire, aesthetic and, and, and my approach to, to producing work is, is um, layering and collaging meaning and things that might be um, really bold with like subtle things underneath it. So um, that's why that, that was that statement because it was just uh, very true. And the other thing is having a, like I said before, having a little kid now, um, it just sort of brings back um, kind of memories about growing up. And I'm in a really different place like geographically now so um, all of that stuff kind of just comes back. Yeah, but I mean, I listen to everything, so I, I can't list it all. Yeah. We put together the faculty show every fall, and we, um, we have made a strong argument for doing the faculty show as a way to share with our students the work that their faculty are doing, um, and really to frame the faculty as working artists, to kind of remind students who see us in classrooms that we also um, work as professionals in our field um, in um, these other ways. And I'm wondering, a question for the studio and graphic design faculty. Um, I was thinking today, I was sitting in um, Xiaoshen Zhang's uh, round table talk, and I should point out that the art historians on the faculty are doing round tables at lunchtime for the next seven or eight weeks um, on Thursdays and Wednesdays, and there's a schedule available. But so I was watching my colleague and I was realizing that I find it incredibly valuable to hear their work and that I actually sometimes don't think of um, the other art historians as working professionally because I mostly talk to them about classes and things like that. So do you guys, um, I'm getting feedback, um, what value do you all get out of seeing each other's work on view like this and kind of participating in the faculty show? Did, did you have the same kind of reactions? Anybody? Yeah, I uh... I absolutely um, love it, and exactly like you said, you're you're um, day to day doing all of this business of um, teaching and all of these administrative duties and things that um, even when you're preparing, like this is what I'm passionate about doing for the rest of my life. You don't realize that there's going to be, you know, 75% of this other work that you're going to have to do that it's probably not like your personality. Um, uh, and so our, our interactions um, by necessity have to be about that kind of thing. And then when I see all of this work up, I realize that um, below this surface that we, that we have to have, that I really just love all these people and that it's like really beautiful stuff and um, it's it, it does I mean you can hear it now it just it, it moves me a lot and I enjoy seeing that because I can see um, not just the things that we sort of have to do and sometimes uh, some of the the conflicts that arise from high pressure sorts of things but really like our soulfulness and uh, and I love that so yeah. Really interesting to the show because we include um, 
adjunct and visiting uh, assistant professors who work in the show. And so I think it's really important to see what they're doing and for students as well to see. But then there's the whole other side where uh, some of us who've been here for a while um, have also watched uh, our peers, uh, colleagues as faculty become a maritime faculty and to see the continuation of their work and Ron's and Dean's and Marty's and uh, I think that's it this year. Uh, Ron's uh, uh, work. Um, is really interesting because you end up seeing a uh, development and evolution of work and new phases and um, so I, I just find that fascinating to see and how certain concepts come back in different ways and how they explore ideas and so I appreciate having the Ameritai faculty um, as part of this exhibition as well. Yeah.